So hey, just a heads up, this isn't yet the channel going back to the daily re-uploads remastered content schedule. I know not everyone was a big fan of that, my, my ad revenue kind of was, but if it pushes viewers away, then, you know, six of one, half dozen and all that. But this is mostly just because I'm pretty sure this one should have gone in with one of the collection shows by now and didn't, and a longtime viewer reminded me that it wasn't available to see anywhere else anymore. Uh, they'd like to see it, so I figured I'd get it on here. Plus, I like this one. I figured if any of the new folks who subscribed as of this movie exists debut are looking for sort of on-theme material, to that this kind of fits uh, working on an update about how that went uh, and another of those well very soon hopefully sooner than later anyway again not gonna flood your inbox with reposts just yet but we are working on how best to get everything organized so enjoy this and stay tuned Okay, so when I want to do one of these things about something that's brand new, I'm supposed to try and not just review the new thing, because it's not really technically a review show, that's the other show, and I should frame it around some other aspect, but I can't really think of a better reason to do a Dark Crystal Age of Resistance episode right now than to tell everyone that they need to absolutely go and watch the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance right the hell now, so I guess this basically counts as a review if you want to get technical about it, and also the supposed to rules on this mainly come from, well, me, so fuck it. Anyway. Movies are weird! But the 1982 Dark Crystal is probably one of the weirdest, at least one of the weirdest ever released by major studios and your theaters with serious money behind it. It was a passion project the Muppets created Jim Henson, essentially his and his company's equivalent to Walt Disney's Fantasia, a big bold swipe at taking the unique art form they'd elevated to massive commercial success and leveraging it to push not only themselves but mainstream cinema and audiences out of their comfort zone into a more sophisticated artistically daring space, and unfortunately just as with every other part of the original release of Fantasia that wasn't Sorcerer's Apprentice, the audience reaction was mostly to go huh and stay far away, leading to a major box office failure and eventually cult classic status on VHS and TV, which is why when they went for a follow-up, they said, okay, maybe let's try putting some famous humans and song numbers into this one and got Labyrinth. Now, I'm not on the team that loved the original Dark Crystal as a kid and thinks it's a legitimate great film, one of my favorites. But it's not hard to see why it was a hard sell at the time, a 100% straight face, no illusion breaks, dark fantasy saga set on an alien world of entirely unearthly geography, architecture, flora, fauna, and every character and animal played by some combination of puppet, animatronic, or suitmation actor inhabiting an inhuman creature designed by fantasy artist Brian Froud. There are no humans, and even the human-looking characters don't look all that human. Plus, while there is a story, it's not necessarily a page-turner. The alien world of Thra is ruled by a coven of evil aristocratic humanoid vulture monsters called the Skeksis who've corrupted the planet's balance by using its power source, the dark crystal of the title, to drain life essence from other living things to prolong their own lives. The last two surviving members of a once prosperous race called Gelflings are charged by the wise from an Agra, the sage-like mystics, to end the Skeksis' power by trekking to their castle and restoring a broken shard of the crystal in order to make it not dark again, unravel a secret twist to the origins of the Skeksis themselves, and save the world. So, uh, fetch quest, basically. The thing of it is, the plot and characterizations were somewhat straightforward and arch, in part because Henson's original concept for the Dark Crystal was to immerse audiences so completely into the alien world that the characters would all speak alien languages with subtitles, so it had to be fairly easy to follow, and it is, particularly since the final version dispensed with the fake language gimmick and essentially provides a non-stop sit-back, sink-in, and let the world wash over you effect that you're either into or not. The point is, even people who loved this movie never really expected to get more of it, because even if it had been successful or widely remembered, of which it was neither, it wasn't really built to be expanded upon. Its lore was designed to feel similar to a lot of other lore, so you could pick it up right away and groove on the immediate feel of the events playing out in front of you. The characters are meant to be recognized as what they are in visual terms. I mean, the Skeksis are disgusting humanoid buzzards wearing the rags of decrepit old-world Baroque aristocrats. The metaphor is not subtle. And what actual story there is ends definitively in the film proper. So while the constant talk of sequels or prequels or reboots and whatever came and went over the years, it was always vaguely disappointing, but not unexpected. But then Netflix, who simultaneously always seemed to have all the money and not enough of the money, picked up the check and suddenly, poof, now the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance suddenly isn't just a one-off prequel, but a ten-episode series that feels set up to launch much more in its wake, executed in style to preserve as much of the puppets-on-puppets -puppets action of the original, and holy shit, in defiance of every obstacle you could throw in front of it, is one of the most incredible things I've seen on film or television all year. A marvel of production design, a miracle of technical filmmaking, a triumph of tone-blurring, genre-defying, dark fantasy storytelling, and maybe the best nostalgia revival work Gen X has yet been gifted. To the degree that anything can be, it's as close to perfect as something like this can get. Now, my big worry, harking back to a moment ago, was that a full series was going to have to try and impose dense storytelling on something that was only ever supposed to work in broad strokes, which Age of Resistance handily solves by making the canvas a lot bigger in the storytelling sense, but keeping committed to the arch broad, and in the end, this is a fairy tale for children, albeit an old-fashioned scary one format of the original. It takes place well before the movie. In context, the planet is still in pretty good shape. There are hundreds of thousands of Gelflings divided up into clans around Duragur caste system of geography 
Skeksian elements that don't get along with each other because impending moral lesson about racism and nobody has managed to figure out that the Skeksis are evil because they keep their evilness out of sight. Mostly. But because they've turned the Dark Crystal dark by doing evil experiments on it to gain power and things have started to go wrong in the environment, and when their head scientist discovers they can also use it to siphon the essence, i.e. souls, out of Gelflings to make themselves functionally immortal, they take the whole cartoon caricatures of the rapacious upper class thing from about an 8 to Dracula in like a weekend, and the Age of Resistance ultimately reveals itself as the story of how the genocide described as preceding the first movie began and who resisted it. Presumably we're meant to think not too hard about the fact that we already know the good guys are eventually going to lose. Now that's a lot of balls for the show to keep in the air just in the premise alone, and the series adds to it by also opting to give answers to exactly how things from the first movie like the Gartham, the Crystal Shard, the Skeksis overall attitude came from, along with tweaking their backstories and their relationship to Mother Agra and the Mystics, and that they managed to pull all of this off is pretty stunning, and I'll admit I was concerned that it felt like the first half of the series was dedicated to the no less than five main character good guys from the various different parts of the world trying to catch each other up on the full plot using psychic plot sharing device, but it really works and it all clicks into place, turning out to have been a really good move to have given everyone so much time to establish themselves, and despite how tremendously grim this eventually gets, there's really no beating around the bush that this is a series about how a bunch of elf muppets very gradually figure out that the gods have decided to kill them and they are pretty much screwed. I appreciate the amount of uh, levity that it throws in, like a very distinct pause in the regrouping where it seems to dawn on the ostensible main hero guy for the first time that there are in fact two lead female characters on his team and he's processing like, wait, is this one of those? Am I that guy? Ah, uh, jeez, I mean, I already got a lot on my plate as it is, punctuated by a quick cut to one of the women's trusty sidekicks giving a mild reaction like, oh shit. Am I the Krillin? But the secret sauce turns out to be the Skeksis themselves. These things scared the shit out of a whole generation who saw the first movie, and seeing more of them here only serves to cement them as the nastiest things the Henson folks ever conjured up. They already look like the stuff of nightmares, and seeing them flail around on screen for ten full episodes as effectively an entire family of monster-shaped Ramsey Boltons who only exist to torture, maim, and torment smaller, more adorable characters and have fun doing it is some of the most disturbing shit you've seen on kids or regular TV in years. I'm dancing around spoilers, but there's a person who should have known better gets their comeuppance beat near the back end of this that's going to traumatize the shit out of younger viewers in a good way, and man, it's been a while since something like this went there. Anyway, I'm sure that there's going to be more to say about this, as there's, you know, more to this, but as it stands, this is a hell of a thing, and if you haven't seen it yet, you should be seeing it. I'm Bob, and that's The Big Picture.